this day, Lord. I just pray that you bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about knowing God, and it's so important to know him. And this word, knowing God, that the Bible uses is talking about an intimate, personal knowledge. And we're going to do a series on 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, because there's so much there about knowing God. I want to read at verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. God wants to give us grace and peace. How? Through or in, in the Greek, it's in the knowledge of Jesus our Lord, as we know him. It says grace and peace will be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied unto you. This knowing means a full knowledge. It's the word that's used when a man and woman in marriage come together physically. A deep knowing. And it's an original word that means a fuller, a riper knowledge. We can never know Jesus enough. Many people think it's just enough I know that he died. You know, there is a... When I first... Right before I came to Berlin, I, I talked to this lady. She was a backslidden Christian, in my opinion. And she was telling me about this modern church she was going to in Berlin. She was a young lady. She was in her late 20s. And she said, Oh, we've heard enough about the cross. We need to hear something else. And I'm going, Honey, it is the cross. That's the whole key. Paul said, I, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. The cross, what Jesus did on the cross, is the key. Paul said, I preach the cross, I preach Jesus Christ crucified, nothing else. Everything is in Christ. He's everything. And knowing him, not just knowing about him, not knowing facts. Yeah, he was born, he died, he raised again, he went to heaven. Knowing him personally is talking about a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he says here, as you have a personal knowledge of God and, and Jesus our Lord, grace and peace would multiply to you. This is interesting. Jesus our Lord is only used one other time. Most of the time it's the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's saying Jesus our Lord. You need to know Jesus as your Lord if you want grace and peace and salvation too. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not my buddy Jesus. He's not my kumpel Jesus. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who sits upon the throne of eternity and is coming back to judge the godless and his people. He's Lord, and as we know him, having him Lord means I belong to you. You say what's in my life. You're sitting behind the steering wheel of the car. You are telling me where to go, and I follow you. And you have the right to. You, Lord Jesus, sit on the throne of my life. And when Jesus sits on the throne of your life, you will know him in a way you never will know him before. Until Jesus sits on the throne of our life, he's someone who's far off. For some people, he's still hanging on the cross, crucifix. He's not. He rose again. But this personal knowledge, you only get to know Jesus personally when he's your Lord. He will not settle for anything less. One person said Jesus is either Lord of all, or not at all. There's no such thing as a half, him being half Lord of your life. Lord means he sits on the throne. Either he sits on the throne of your life, or he doesn't. He's not sitting on the throne half of it, and you sitting on the other half. And as we know him as Lord, we have grace and peace. Because he's a good Lord. As we know God, grace means undeserved favor. I don't earn God's favor. Grace is the picture of him always leaning towards me, always extending himself to reach out to help. This is a picture in the Old Testament for grace of God, picture in the New Testament. He's bending down. He's wanting to help. He's gracious. Not because we deserve it. We can never deserve anything. We're never good enough. All our righteousness is filthy menstrual rags, it says in Isaiah. But... He's grace. His grace is enough. And when you want to know what grace is, read the scriptures in the Bible about grace. He says in Ephesians 2, 
For by grace are you saved through faith, verse 8, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace. You don't earn your salvation. Do you realize that's the difference between biblical Christianity and all other religions? All other religions, non-Christian religions, the people are trying to work. They have to make these trips to the holy place. They have to fast. They have to do this, do that, <clears throat> pray enough of the rosary, and maybe they might make it to heaven. And these religions, the false religions, the people do not know they're going to heaven. They hope. Because it's by works. They're trying to work their way. They're trying to be good enough. They're trying to earn the approval of some their idea of God. Only in New Testament Christianity are we saved by grace. We're in the land of Martin Luther. What a precious truth God brought back to his church. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in him. Not by works. Not by your good works. In 2 Timothy 1.9 it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This is another picture of grace. As we know Christ more, as we know God more, he saved you, but he's called you with a holy calling. You and I are called to live a holy life. We're a holy priesthood. It's a holy calling to follow Christ. It's not just, okay, I need a few workers. No, no, it's something holy. It's something precious. And he says he called us, but according to his own purpose and grace, God called you. Jesus chose you because of his plan, his purpose, and his grace. Not because he looked at you and said, oh, I think that'll be a good worker. I think she'll do good. No, no, it's his grace. And for his own purpose. He has a plan. And it's all his grace based on what Jesus did on the cross. And it says this, this purpose that God has for you was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This grace, God's purpose for you and me, was in Christ Jesus before the world began. He was there before. As we more and more get to know Christ, who he is, we realize he was there before the world was created. I can trust him. He'll be there when we're all gone, too. And when this world is falling apart. But he had a purpose and a plan, and it's grace, grace, grace. Jesus said, you've not chosen me in John 15, but I've chosen you and called you to bring forth fruit that you may glorify the Father. You and I were chosen to glorify God, to give him glory and honor. Romans 4, 4, now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you want to try and earn something from God by good works, go ahead. But your reward is not going to be too much. Galatians 5, 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. As we understand, only Jesus and his blood on the cross can save me, can cleanse me. He is my righteousness. He is my sanctification. 1 Corinthians 1.30. That's grace. Unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. And then he says in Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As we know him more and more, we know I can come to God because of what Jesus did, because of being in Christ, him, his blood. I can come to him and he'll give me grace. Yes, he will correct us, but that's grace too. Oh my goodness, what if God would not correct us when we're going wrong, doing wrong? That would be not love. It's grace you know, sometimes we get upset when, when God convicts us of sin. It isn't, it isn't pleasant, but it's grace. Thank God that you are in a position to know when he's convicting you of sin. It is grace because he says sin will destroy you. Sin will destroy your relationships. Sin will destroy your life and will separate you from me. It is the grace of God that he convicts us of sin so that we can turn and run to the blood of Jesus, run to Christ and have forgiveness and cleansing. That's grace. We don't try and just do better. Okay, God, that was wrong, I sinned. Okay, I'll try and do better next time. No, no, we come and say, Jesus, forgive me. Cleanse me by your blood. Change my heart. That's grace. Thank you for showing me. Thank you for the grace. 
we come to the throne of grace and we find help and grace in time of need. When we have a time of need, he's going to give us grace. He's going to give us help. And the more that we know him, it's all about knowing Christ, who he is, his character, how he is. The more we know, I can come. I can come to him and I'll get grace. Not because I deserve it. Grace is unmerited favor, but because Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Jesus' blood cleanses me. I'm born again. I'm a new creation. And I'm in His righteousness and in Christ. And that's grace too. And it sets you free from trying to earn things from God and be good enough. We do want to be faithful. But His grace, and He says, my grace is sufficient for you in the middle of hard times. That's grace. My grace is sufficient for you. And we know that only as we walk through difficult times. You get to know someone by spending time with them. Um, when I was a child, we used to, in America, we used to drive like three weeks. My mother, my brother, and sister and I, we were all teenagers or earlier, younger. Three weeks in the car with your family. We would stop here and be in the hotel and see things, but three weeks is a long time got on each other's nerves. And I, and, and I thought, later years, I took a, a longer trip with a girlfriend and, and a couple friends, and I thought, you really get to know someone when you're on a trip with them in a car longer than just a few hours, even a few hours maybe. But you be on the road for a while. I, I often thought, I actually should never marry anybody until um, you have taken a trip with them, not alone. You don't take trips alone. If you're not married, you need to have people with you. But you've taken a trip. And you find out how they are when they're tired, when it's a long way, they're hungry, how are they? <laughs> and as we walk with Christ, as we live with him day by day, we get to know him better. He is faithful. He is good. He does do what he says he does. It's grace. In knowing him, we know his grace. And peace. God wants us to have peace. We read in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. God wants to multiply grace to you, multiply peace to you, peace. Peace is not dependent upon your emotions, upon the situation, the circumstances. Peace is dependent upon Him. And the more and more we know Him, no matter what happens in our life, we can know He's in control. As we know Him, that He's the God who was and is and evermore so be, sits on the throne of eternity, we will have peace in the midst of trial. We will have peace no matter what comes. He is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Peace is not the absence of trouble. It's in the midst of the trouble, knowing I can trust God. We're in a time, this, this COVID corona type time, it's hard to have peace. We have to focus on Him. But the more we know Him to know, He was, before the world began, He sat on the throne. And it's not the politicians that are in control of my life in the end, it's Him. He's my peace. In Philippians 4, 9, it talks about, these things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. He's called the God of peace. He not just gives peace, he is peace. What did Jesus tell the disciples in the middle of the storm? What did he always say? Peace. Don't be afraid. Peace. Now, if some you're in the middle of a situation... And somebody you don't really trust or don't know very well, they say, oh, don't worry, it'll be okay, just have peace. I'm going, how do you know? I don't know. It doesn't look like it's going to turn out good here. But if someone we know, Jesus says, I'm with you. Have peace. I'm not going to forsake you. Then we can know, okay, it's going to be okay. The boat is not going to sink. It looks like it. But it's not going to sink because he's in the boat with me. That's what the disciples learned. So the more and more and more we get to know him, the more his peace, which passes all understanding, will be multiplied. You get peace, cast your cares on him, he said, because he cares for you. And this scripture has become one of my favorites in this time of corona and COVID where we have all kinds of things going on. Hebrews chapter 13, and I think here in, in New Beginnings, it's becoming really another foundation. It says, let your, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, let your conversation be without covetous and be content with such things as you have. And here it is. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
Jesus said, as his child, as a born-again child of God, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I lay down my life for my sheep. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says in John 10, he says, you are in my hands and no one can take you out of my hands. And you are in the Father's hands. We're one and no one can take you out of the Father's hands. That's peace. No matter what happens to know, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now there's people that have said that to you before. Yeah, yeah, I'll always love you. Yeah, yeah, I'll always be with you. And where are they today? A person can't make that promise like God can. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You're my child. You're born again. You're a part of my family. That's peace. Even if we end up in, in prison. Persecution is going to come more. Some of us may and one day end up in prison for our faith. Can you have peace in prison? Only if you're trusting God. Only if you're trusting the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We read stories of people, Christians in prison, and um, one of the stories I remember particularly, they were being tortured, and it was such a long prison time in a communist prison, and they said that there were times where God's presence was so strong. The walls were like glistening with diamonds. There was such a presence of God. It was unbelievable. His grace, there we have grace again. He said, my grace is sufficient for you because I'm there. It makes all the difference who's with you. When we're in times of trouble, there's nobody really that wants to go through a difficult time alone. You don't want to be alone. We want a friend there. We want a pastor there. We want family there. We don't want to be alone. But there are times, beloved, where you will be alone. When my dad died, I had my family there, but I walked through that grief alone. When my mother died suddenly, I had family, but nobody was inside my heart. I walked through that alone. I had people praying. It was wonderful. I thank God for it. But in the end, only Jesus was with me in the night hours alone. Only Jesus was inside and knew really what the grief was, what the pain was, what the desperation was. And he said, so he will not leave you alone no matter what happens. And the more we know him, the more know we have this peace where Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what does it say in verse 6, chapter 13, 6? So that we may boldly say, so he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What do we say? So that we may boldly say, not nah, maybe, perhaps, it could be, I hope. Boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do to me. We can only do that when we know him as our helper, as our God who was and is and evermore shall be, as Jesus that gave his blood for us. He gave his blood for you. Why is he going to desert you in times of, of trouble? He said, I will never leave you for, nor forsake you. You can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He's going to help me. I will not fear what man shall do to me. I have sometimes feared what man will do to me, and we do fear what man do, the politics will do to us, but in the end, we have to say, the Lord is my helper. He's promised to go with me, even though maybe things are coming that I don't want and I don't like and I, they are against my free will. The Lord is with me. I'm going to make it because he's with me. We can go through anything if the Lord is with us. Just read the Bible. Just read all the testimonies of the men and women of God in the Bible, what they went through, but they got through it because the Lord was with them. And you and I can get through whatever happens because the Lord is with us. He's our helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. What's the worst they can do? They can kill us and then we're with God. <laughs> out of this body that pulls us down, out of the trouble, out of the stress, I will not fear. This is peace, knowing him, knowing he's my helper. Those people that I trusted and thought could help me, they, they're in trouble themselves. They can't help me. But God is my help. The more and more that we know our God in Christ, the more and more we have his peace. And it's all about knowing him. We're in a time where there's so much emphasis on doing, 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 being, doing, doing, doing. And we're supposed to serve him. He says, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You'll do what I say. But even more than that, his plan is to change us into the likeness of Christ, 
that his life is through us and in us. Who you are, your character. Who you are when nobody's watching. How do you act then? What are you looking at on your Facebook then? What are you reading on internet then? Character. You know, every time we do things we know we shouldn't do, it hurts our relationship with God, it grieves his heart, and it puts a blemish on our character. And then we have to, as we realize, we run to him and say, Jesus, forgive me. You know, it's grace when God shows us something wrong in our life. It's his love, it's his grace. The more and more we know him, the more and more he says, his grace and peace will be multiplied unto us. Paul, thorn in the flesh, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul experienced the grace of God as almost maybe no apostle did. He found out because he knew Christ intimately, his grace is enough. I'm going to be able to make it even with this suffering, this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan. His throne is the throne of grace. He's the God of grace. He's the God of peace. Just look at Jesus and the cross and you see the grace of God. So, don't just focus on what I have to do, what I have to do, make, do, earn, make. Focus on I want to know you. I want to know you. That's Paul, the greatest apostle, wrote in Philippians that I may know him. Not be found in my own righteousness, but the righteousness which of Christ. That I may know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. It will take us an eternity to know God and to know Christ. Focus on that he may know him. He wants us to know him. That's his desire. How do we know him? Prayer. God's word. Being in the fellowship of believers where the word of God is preached. And God says, that's a command. Do not forsake the assembling yourselves together. In Hebrews it says that. And even more so as you see the day approaching. We're in the last days. Jesus is coming back. This is not the time to be getting out of church. This is not the time to say, well, I'm going to just stay home because it's much easier to sit with my coffee and pajamas and listen to the preacher. That is not church. Obviously, with the, with the COVID, there was times where we had to do that. But once you can go, he says, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. It's totally different than fellowship. But this time of prayer and the word of God, people, oh, I'm tired of hearing that. There is no other way. <laughs> There's no shortcut. We're in a late time of shortcut. People want to go, well, I want to hear this video, and I want to hear this sermon, and I want to be a mighty person of God. There's no shortcut. You read Joseph. To become a mighty man of God, he had to go through trials and tribulations. You read about Abraham. You read about Paul. You read about anybody in the Bible that did anything for God. They went through a time of growing and developing in hard times and learning to know God and trust God. There's no shortcut. This is the way you come to know God. God is going to speak to you first and reveal himself first through his word, not through some prophet or someone that calls himself a prophet, not through some video. Through your time reading God's word, meditating on his word, and prayer, talking to him one-on-one, -on -one, and then praying with believers together. But this person, look at I know him. You want to know someone, you spend time with him. And the more you want to know them, the more you want to spend time alone, not with 15 other people that want to talk about all kinds of stuff that you're not interested in talking about. He's a God that wants to be known. He wants to reveal himself. He's a good father. You know him if you're born again. He says, my sheep know my voice. You just, we just have to learn to slow down and listen. We are to do, we are to obey, but being transformed in his likeness, in this intimate relationship with Christ. He's the vine, we're the branches. As we know him more and more, as we're living in him, trusting him, following him, putting a whole trust in him, our focus on him, he will reveal himself. 
Jesus said that. If you keep my words, I will come, and my Father will come, and we will reveal ourselves unto you. That's in John chapter 15. So, God wants you to have his peace. God wants you to have his grace, to know it more and more. We've just begun, beloved, to know him and his grace and his peace. He wants to multiply it, but it comes through knowing Jesus, our Lord. He's Lord. And through knowing our God. We're going to continue with this series on 1 Peter chapter 2, knowing him. And because he says, if you read 1 Peter, 1 Peter uh, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, at the end, it got a list of whole things we're going to look at, but it says, verse 10, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. What a promise. You'll never fall. You'll never fall away from God. You'll never get away. If you do those things that are written, verse 2 through verse 11, and we'll look at those in the next weeks to come. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you are God of grace. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace that you show us in Jesus Christ, in the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us. Lord Jesus, that you're our holiness, that you are our righteousness, that you are everything. Lord, thank you that we don't have to try and earn forgiveness, that it's a free gift as we repent and put our trust in Christ and your blood. Lord, help us more and more to, to, to want to know you. Not just to know about you. To know you intimately, personally, on a deeper level. Personal. You and us, our God, our Creator, our Father. Jesus, our Lamb, our Savior, our Lord. We want to know you more. Father, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you say you don't know him, he says, it's, there's thing, what you do is you realize you're a sinner, not just you do bad things, you are a sinner, who you are. Your nature is to sin, the Bible says we're enemies of God. And you repent and say, I want to turn, I turn from my sin, I leave it, Jesus, I can't without you. You put your whole trust in Jesus, what he did on the cross for you. His blood is what cleanses and saves us, the blood of Jesus. You put your trust in his blood and you commit Believe on him means to commit. I commit my life to you. And he says, if you do that, I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you. You'll be born again. you become a child of God. You'll have a new life, a new beginning. And you'll begin to walk with Christ, to know him. God bless you.